African savanna on safari looking for Mike is that a lion stalking us I think it's something much scarier <sighs> it's a search term report and someone has keywords with 150% a cost oh no they never added any negative keywords. Oh, and it looks like all their bids are just three dollars. No bid optimization? We're in trouble. We need to do something about this giant A cost, but I don't know if we can do it alone. Oh no, it's the ad badger. Should we run? No, no, no. The ad badger can save us. He'll rip that high A cost to shreds with bid optimization and negative keywords. What's going on, Badger Nation? It's Mike and Brett from Ad Badger, and you're listening to the PPC Den Podcast, the world's first Amazon PPC advertising podcast, and your source for all of the tips, tricks, and optimization strategies you need to get the most from your Amazon ads. How about that new intro? It definitely has me on the edge of my seat. <laughs> that was a uh, that was a fun one to record, Mike. How about you? Uh, I you know what our podcast listens are going up every month, which is awesome. But I think for this episode, it's mostly me listening to that podcast intro twenty five times. Uh, <laughs> you know, we were inspired by the greats. We were inspired by you know a Steve Irwin or a David Attenborough nature documentary. You know, they loved exploring nature. Uh, we love exploring search term reports. Absolutely. And with all that being said, we're going to jump right into some company updates and some news, guys. The first one being that we just released our positive keyword tool last week. It's out of alpha and it is now in beta. And it is a great way to find all of your converting ASINs and all of your converting search terms without even having to deal with a pesky search term report. How about Boom. that? That's it. Uh, another update that we rolled out was an update to the bid optimizer, what we lovingly call bids by Badger. And, you know, one of the things that I really wanted, uh, what we all wanted inside the bids by Badger algorithm was a way to optimize bids from day one. Uh, and it's very difficult to do that because there's zero clicks, zero impressions, zero conversions. And then, you know, a day, a day later, you might have 10 clicks. Uh, or five clicks or however many clicks and no conversion still. So understanding how to do that, we've been studying a lot of what the data has been telling us. We've been listening to feedback. We've been looking at campaigns and came up with an update about a week or so ago. And I'm really happy with what it's doing. And we'll, that's something we'll continue to optimize and update. Mm -hmm. And then we also have uh, some hiring updates to talk about, don't we? Yes, you can go to adbadger.com slash careers and see some of our current positions. What we've got up there right now is a digital marketer with some PPC experience. Uh, so people with Amazon PPC experience, believe it or not, it's so new that it's often hard to come by um, someone looking for a gig with Amazon PPC experience. So if you've got Google Ads experience or even Facebook Ads experience, you understand the lingo, there's no better place to learn Amazon PPC than the Badger Den so if you have some paid traffic experience, would love for you to check out the job listing or share it with someone you'd love. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's been a great place to work. Uh, you know, I just joined the Ad Badger team a few months ago, but I've had an absolute blast. Everyone here is just really nice and really caring and really wonderful to work with. So, uh, you know, we're really excited to find another um, digital marketer with, with PPC experience to bring on board and welcome you into our team. So if that's you, definitely apply, guys. You won't be disappointed. Brett, you are making me blush. And I guess I guess you technically are paid to say that. So take, <laughs> take that for what you want, everyone. Uh, but feel free to hit me up on LinkedIn. My name on LinkedIn is just Michael Erickson Fasheen. Go ahead, check us out. Drop me a line. Let me know you're applying. Um, all right, let's get in to our featured segment. Let's start the jungle safari music. All right, this is part two of our Hitchhiker's Guide to Sponsored Products. Uh, last week in episode six, that was part one. And really what we wanted to do was have 
two episodes where we try to cover as many sponsored products topics as we could. Uh, so part one, we covered a lot about general setup and we introduced uh, the research peel stick and block or the RPSB strategy. Uh, in this episode, we're going to cover more topics. And essentially what this is, uh, Brett and I, we created and we are creating and updating an Amazon PPC course. So unit one was just like introduction, talking about the Amazon advertising opportunity. Unit two was a lot of the theory that goes into sponsored products. And then in unit three, it was very down in the weeds, nitty gritty, nuts and bolts, over the shoulder type optimizations, how to actually optimize uh, sponsored products. So this is the episode that we're going to point to anytime someone wants a complete crash course into Amazon sponsored products. So let's kick things off with one of the first and most important uh, types of optimizations that we're going to mention this episode, which is negative keywords. Uh, you know, negative keywords are one of the most important things uh, that any campaign needs. And there's really different kinds of categories and reasons why you'd want to add a negative keyword. Uh, the first is general. It's talking about just the general category of terms. So if a term is completely irrelevant, then you would block it. Uh, so if I'm selling a fitness jump rope and I get an impression for kids jump rope, then obviously I'd want to block the word kids because I don't want kids from triggering and uh, my ads and seeing an ad for like an adult fitness jump rope in this example. Um, but there's also some more nuanced reasons to add negative keywords. Uh, Brett, you want to touch on some other reasons other than a term just being completely irrelevant. When would a term maybe be relevant, but we want to consider it as a negative anyway? Uh, yeah. So basically, if you have terms that are not performing very well and are not bringing in any sales uh, and basically just wasting your ad budget, it's a good idea to add those to your negative keyword list as well. And, you know, that rings true, especially with auto campaigns. So if you have a high ACoS auto campaign, you have two options. The first option is reduce the default bid that applies to all the terms. Uh, and then the second option you have is negative keyword optimization, getting rid of any keywords with really bad metrics. And we kind of, you know, here at Ad Badger, we have these three rules that we've, uh, you know, sat down and really discussed and grinded out. And these rules, uh, we love them, we're confident in them. And these are the ones that we suggest to our customers. The first one is looking through every single search term and any term with over 34 clicks that has not brought a sale will get added as a negative keyword. And the reasoning behind that is uh, by the point you get to 34 clicks, you will already be performing at three times worse than the average conversion rate, which means that that particular keyword is probably not very relevant uh, you know, to your product. So that's our first criteria uh, for finding something to add to the negative keyword list. If it has over 34 clicks and it hasn't gotten you a sale, add it to the negative keyword list. The second one we have is anything with over $35 in spend that has not uh, brought you a sale as well. That's going to get added to the negative keyword list uh, because there's really no point in continuing uh, you know, to just spend and spend and spend if it's not getting you a sale. You know, it's, This is your Amazon business. This isn't a charity. And you need to make sure that what you are bidding on in PPC is actually going to be making you money and it's actually worth bidding on. So, you know, that's what over $35 in spend without a conversion will do for you. And then the last rule that we have, but certainly not the least, is anything with over 2,500 impressions with a click-through rate below 0.18%, that also gets added as a negative keyword uh, because it just so happens to be that that click-through rate is so low that customers aren't really finding your product relevant to what they're searching for. So those are the three rules that we like to use. And what would you give uh, as advice for adding these as phase or exact match? Phrase or exact match, sorry. Yeah, that's right. So, you know, a lot of clicks, no conversions, a lot of spend, no conversions, a lot of impressions, really bad click-through rate, no conversions. Those sort of three categories uh, of terms uh, 
when we add them, we always want to ask ourselves, should I be adding this as a negative phrase or a negative exact? And in case anyone's unclear about what a negative phrase versus a negative exact is, uh, let's explain that really quickly. So let's say, just for that easy example, let's say I do sell a jump rope and it's a fitness type jump rope for your home gym. Uh, and I did get an impression for kids jump rope. Uh, I have a decision to make there. Should I be adding that as a negative phrase or a negative exact? Uh, so if I were to add kids jump rope as a negative exact, I would be blocking just that exact search. I wouldn't block anything else. It would only block one, that one thing. Uh, so that's what a negative exact would do. If I were to add the negative, negative phrase kids, I would then be blocking every single search with the word kids inside of it. So kids playground jump rope, I would block it. Uh, exercise equipment for kids, I would be blocking it. Uh, exercise equipment that uh, for adults, not kids, I'd be blocking that too uh, because it still has the word kids in it. So when you add something as a negative phrase, and typically you do this with a one or two word uh phrase, uh, oftentimes when you do that, you're going to be blocking everything that has that word or words inside of it uh, compared to exact where you're just blocking that one exact thing. So in general, uh, if something crosses over these thresholds, uh, by default, definitely add it as a negative exact. And then what, you would, then what you would do is after you add it as a negative exact, you would see if there's any trends in there. So, you know, if I notice that I'm selling this jump rope and, you know, kids jump rope or jump rope for kids, jump rope uh, for playground, uh, for kids playground. If I notice that this word kids is everywhere, then I probably want to also add negative phrase kids. Uh, and that's really how negative phrase and negative exact or coordinated. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, guys, we do want to make you aware um, <clears throat> right now uh, with your auto campaigns, you can actually appear on other sellers of listings. Uh, you can actually appear on an ASIN. Uh, so some of these ASINs will actually, unfortunately, be really poor performers for your ad, especially other ASINs that are best sellers or are the top ASINs in your category. So uh, right now, there's nothing we can really do to prevent an auto campaign from appearing uh, on those particular ASINs. However, uh, you know, Mike and I both think that in the future, we're going to have negative product targeting, which is going to allow you to uh, add an ASIN as a negative target. Uh, in the future. So, you know, that's something we're expecting, uh, something we're really hoping for. And, you know, we'll be sure to update you guys right away as soon as that change is implemented, if it happens. I'm sure it will. You know, the trend that Amazon has been going is just every so often, seemingly like every month at this point, there's new updates, there's new advancements. They're sort of borrowing things from Google ads. They're borrowing things from Facebook ads. Um, they're building a more robust pay traffic ecosystem. So, Surely they have, they should have the capabilities to have negative ASIN targeting. So you punch in an ASIN and then you stop yourself from appearing on it. Um, maybe one day we'll also have negative category targeting. Wouldn't it be nice to just block if I'm if I am selling that adult fitness jump rope to just block the entire kids category or something like that? Uh, waiting patiently. If anyone out there works at Amazon is listening. Yeah, it it'd be really nice because that would get rid of a lot of the. Uh you know, the inefficient ASINs that we don't want to appear for, but we actually have a system uh, to sort of prevent that from happening. And that that's kind of why we use the method that we use. And that is the RPSB method. So, yes. you know, in this episode, Mike, I know uh, you kind of wanted to explain the math behind RPSB. So you want to hop into that? Sure. Let's do it. Fun challenge. Explain some math via podcast. Uh, so, RPSB, Research Peel, Stick, and Block, uh, if you have not listened to episode six, definitely go back and check it out. But if you just want to forge ahead, if you're just starting with us right now in episode seven and, and just want to work your way up from here, let me explain. Uh, research Peel, Stick, and Block basically is a framework uh, where you cast a wide net and you have research-based campaigns, research-based ad groups like auto campaigns, uh, and then you peel out the keywords and the ASINs that convert best, then you stick those keywords and ASINs that convert best into a 
manual campaign, uh, manual exact or ASIN targeting, and then you block it from appearing in that initial research-based campaign. Now there's some math behind this. And basically the math behind this dictates why you would go through this process. So why not just have one auto campaign? You're gonna show up for everything anyway. The big issue with that is you're gonna be bidding the average across all of those thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of impressions that you're going to accrue in that auto campaign. For example, uh, if I, I, I'm trying to jump rope more, I'm trying to get in shape. Uh, so this is why I keep on coming back to the jump rope. Uh, but basically, if I've run an auto campaign for jump rope, some of the searches I'm gonna appear for are men's jump rope, fitness jump rope, uh, exercise equipment, so you can already imagine that exercise equipment probably will not convert as well as men's jump rope, right? It makes total sense. And men's jump rope probably won't convert as well as uh, men's turquoise jump rope, something very specific, right? And if I sell that product in that variation, then I'm probably should expect a higher conversion rate. So we have three tiers of products. There's products that are uh, searches are that are very specific, searches that are kind of specific, and searches that are just completely general. We can assume that the more general a search is, the lower the conversion rate. And we can assume the more specific the search is, the higher the conversion rate. So what does this all mean? This means in an auto campaign, I'm going to be bidding the average for all three of these things, meaning the general one, it might convert, but it does not deserve a big bid. The middle of the road one converts, but it deserves a middle of the road bid. And the one that converts really well I want to bid very aggressively to be sure that I'm maintaining top visibility, to be sure that I'm uh, always showing up for all my impressions. And if you're not bidding aggressively on the best terms, and, you're, and if you're not bidding middle of the road, and if you're not bidding low on the low converting, your A cost will just be the blended average across all of these things. We don't really want to be lazy and just bid the blended average of everything. We want to bid aggressively on the high converting things and bid low on the low converting things. Basically, we want to never overbid or never underbid. So what doing the RPSB helps us accomplish is that we're going to be bidding aggressive on the top performing things, uh, which gives us the most visibility. And we can afford it because it converts very high. It's going to have a high revenue per click. And then we want to bid low on the lower converting things um, because that's all it dictates. You know, something that converts at 2% versus something that converts at 10%, there's probably going to be a five times difference into how we bid on these things. You know, the difference might be 20 cents versus a dollar. Uh, the difference might be you know, something along those lines. And that's exactly the math that we want to do here. So that's an overview of the math of why doing research peel, stick and block makes so much sense. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like Mike just said, guys, you, there's a lot of benefits to be able to uh, bid differently on uh, different things that you can show up for. The problem is auto campaigns only give you one default bid that applies to everything. Manual campaigns, however, uh, you can individualize the bid on a keyword by keyword basis or on an ASIN by ASIN basis if you're doing ASIN targeting. And, so, and, here's, something, and here's something else that people don't really think of either. If you have a phrase or broad match, you're also bidding the average of hundreds or thousands of searches. So if I bid on broad match jump rope, I'm actually going to be showing up for hundreds of different terms related to that. And then I, my bid is the average of all these things. So that's why it's so important to do the RPSB or that keyword graduation or the search term graduation, whatever it gets, it's called. That's why it's so pertinent to have that graduation process to exact, to ASIN targeting. So you're bidding exactly what something is worth. Mm -hmm. So up next, we have building ASIN targeting ad groups. So this is one of the most exciting updates. Uh, Amazon snuck in right before, I think it was right before the holiday season in December, but they basically, um, the Amazon gave us a nice little gift, wrapped it up, put it right under the Christmas tree, and it was ASIN targeting. Finally, uh, we were able to target things on an ASIN basis. So we're the, the current SOP for this, the current way to optimize this and the way to incorporate this in our optimization process is very similar to the way that we've been optimizing actual search terms and uh, actual keywords. Basically, we're going to look at that search term report. 
We're going to look at the ASINs that converted, not just the keywords anymore, um, not just the actual words people searched, but the actual ASINs. So uh, in case there's anyone out there who does not know, there's two places sponsored products you show up for. The first is very simple. You show up for different searches. The second is as a suggested product while you're while a consumer is looking at a product page. So if someone's looking at you know, Mike's exercise equipment and they click on uh, one of my jump ropes, they will see sponsored products related to this item. It'll be you know, right at the bottom of the sort of the bullet points uh, and it'll say sponsored products related. People can look at comparable products and then eventually click on this. Now, up until this point, the only way to appear there was to run an auto and then get some visibility there. However, Amazon just rolled out ASIN-specific targeting. So you can actually type in the ASINs that converted from your auto and then bid more aggressively on it. Again, this is, ex this is tied exactly back to the math reasons of why you would do RPSB in the first place because it allows you to bid the right amount. It allows you to bid more aggressively and show up in a better position for your competitor's ASINs. So, you know, if... Brett, if you're selling a jump rope and the jump rope is lower quality than mine and maybe it has poor ASIN ratings and I ended up getting a conversion via auto campaigns, I'm going to type your ASIN in to my ASIN targeting campaigns and I'll show up for your products as a suggested product. Sorry to say. Yep. Um, unfortunately, you would have a really, really high A cost because uh, my jump rope converts better than any other jump rope on Whoa, the market. Okay. Um, <laughs> however, uh, there is one thing with ASIN targeting that I uh, kind of want to warn people about. And, uh, you know, lately, just over the last month or so, I've had a lot of uh, people reach out and say, hey, uh, you know, I launched this new product targeting ad and it's not going well at all. Uh, what's going on? And it ends up that people are just going ahead and uh, adding Amazon's suggested ASINs uh, into their product targeting campaigns. And, you know, whenever I take that ASIN and I plug it into Amazon to figure out what they're bidding on, it's actually like the best seller that Amazon is, is suggesting for your uh, product targeting ads. So, guys, make sure that with product targeting ads, you're targeting the worst possible listings. You want the listings that people are not interested in buying and are actively looking for an alternative product for. Uh, and, you know, if they're looking for an alternative product, and your ad shows up right next to it, you're going to be able to get a lot of really efficient, optimized, and low ACoS sales using product targeting. Just make sure that they're really bad listings you're showing up on. Yeah. How about, and what, how about this? What a concept. You can find out if these things are converting from your auto campaign research and just, just throw them in there. You already know that they convert, um, which is pretty neat. Um, so we, so far we've talked about like really specific you know, we talked about the auto campaign casting a wide net. We talked about RPSB with uh, the searches that people make, graduating those up to exact match. We talked about getting the ASIN targeting, throwing that in a manual ASIN targeting ad group. There's other ways to cast a wide net. Uh, and it's another gift that Amazon just gave us within the last month or so. That's category targeting and brand targeting. And this is exactly related to what you were just talking. Uh, category targeting. Uh, you can now target specific categories. Uh, you can also target specific competitor brands. Um, now, there's some so there's some predictions to be made here, right? This is so new. Best practice, I don't think, has come out yet. But just sort of predicting how best practice will go, one of the immediate things, so when you, you type in, you know, exercise equipment, uh, when you type in a competitor brand, one of the options that you'll be able to get uh, is filter by ASIN. So this relates exactly to what you were talking about, Brett, where you, know, you don't want to bid on your competitor's four or five star rated products. Maybe you want to bid on their two and a half stars or something like that. That's actually a setting when you go and set up these campaigns to bid on some of your categories or competitor brands lowest converting products. Uh, so that's probably the best way to use that. And I'm super interested to see how this really plays out to see if category targeting and brand targeting matures, because this may, may, question mark, not sure yet, but this may replace some auto campaign 
work. Uh, and the way that I'd really love to see it replace it, or actually not replace it, but just add to it, I would love to run an auto campaign, block my exact match converting terms, right? That's one. And then I would love to block categories, and then I'll just set up a manual category targeting uh, and let the auto find other things. And then I'll set up a manual brand, and then I'll block the brand from the auto. So it's like the auto campaign is just finding things that I have yet to think of. That's mm -hmm. how I really love to use these things. Will it happen? I don't know. You know, I actually have some good anecdotal evidence uh, and data to work on for this stuff. Um, so I was actually on a call with uh, one of my favorite customers, Jan, today, and we were uh, talking about a category targeting ad she had. And, uh, you know, she'd kind of just launched this on a whim and she included even the four star and the five star versions of all of the ASINs in her, uh, not just her category, but many categories that were similar to her category as well. Um, so that ACOS was like 330%. Ouch. <laughs> yeah. On a, on a, launching things on a whim is often not the best uh, campaign optimization strategy. Mm -hmm. And then on the flip side, um, I have launched some category targeting ads uh, for some other customers. And I only included... Um, one star, two star, and three star listings, and 20% ACOS. Boom. That's awesome to hear. Wow. <laughs> mm -hmm. So yeah, guys, definitely exclude the best performers from your category targeting and also from your product targeting. That is a badger tip for you. Badger tip. Uh, the other kind of, the other way to cast a wide net in a manual campaign is of course to use broad and phrase. Uh, again, where you throw a throw a word or words inside there. And then with broad, Amazon will find some synonyms or related terms. And then with phrase, it'll find searches that have what you punched in in your keyword as part of the phrase. So if I type in jump rope, I will appear as phrase match for men's jump rope, women's jump rope, kids jump rope, so on and so forth. Sometimes it might be irrelevant, that's why checking your search term report is so important. That's why doing RPSB is so important. Uh, and if I type in broad, I'm going to show up for synonyms and stems of those synonyms. Uh, so jump rope might uh, show my ads for, you know, uh, fitness jump rope. It might also go a step further away, things like exercise equipment. So you need to be really careful when you run broad match. Um, so I like to use these. Uh, it's just another way to get additional data. Uh, when I use them, I'm always sure that I'm using them sort of controlled with a lower bid. I understand that this is a research-based keyword, not an exact match type keyword. Uh, I also try to stick it in their own ad group, so I often like label the ad group. Uh, I think our next episode, episode eight, is going to be all about campaign and ad group naming. Um, so I won't get too much into it here, but I always like let myself know as a reminder inside that ad group that this is a broader phrase research ad group. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, our next topic here that we really wanted to hit on this episode was handling high ACOS. So there's a whole lot that goes into this, but, you know, when you open up a new account for the first time and they have a really high ACOS, what are the first steps looking like for you? Yes. So the first thing I do is I check their sort of their, their keyword control or their search term control or just the general control of the account. And basically I try to grab, I try to find this ratio. The first ratio is uh, amount of spend that like you're actively bidding on versus the amount of research. So for example, if you have just one auto campaign, that means a hundred percent of your spend is being spent on things that are outside of your control. Uh, meaning Amazon's automatically showing you for loads of different searches and impressions uh, that you're just not in control of. So doing the RPSB method should pull some of the spend away from things that you don't control to things that you do control. So that's definitely one of the first things that I look at. Uh, and this clues me into proper account structure. You know, was this campaign thoughtful in how it sets up its research campaigns and how it sets up its sort of winner circle or dedicated, uh, reliable core spend? Nine times out of 10, campaigns with a high ACoS uh, have 
that issue of sort of the keyword control, the second most common high ACoS issue is when people go to some keyword research tool, they had they skipped the research phase, they skipped that auto campaign or even the category targeting or whatever it might be. They skip that and they just go to a keyword tool. They drop in 100, 150 keywords that they hope would convert. And then they find out the tough way that, you know, we need to, you know, we need to let the data tell us what converts. Um, and if you think about it, even though the thresholds and the parameters that we talked about before you would pause a keyword, it's hard. So if you drop a hundred keywords inside your account that are untested, that you pulled from a keyword research tool that are broad match or phrase match, every single one of these needs to hit at, you know, 10, 20, 30 clicks before you can actually determine if it's going to, you know, work out. That means 10 clicks times, uh, t- uh, I'm sorry, a hundred keywords times 30 clicks. That's a whole bunch of clicks right there before you can even establish if just one keyword on its own is going to convert. Uh, so that's generally another cause of a high ACoS. And I try to look for these issues. These are very common high ACoS account issues. Um, and then, of course, you know, we try to fix that. And some of the things that we do is just sort of work backwards. Uh, we try to get as much data as we can, as fast as we can. We try to set up the RPSB. Uh, we try to say, hey, if you got these terms from you know, some tool, uh, there's cheaper and more efficient ways to do our research. And that's with an auto campaign usually. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think a lot of the confusion there stems from uh, when you're doing listing optimization, it's great to put all of those uh, all of those keywords that you can find in a keyword tool uh, right into your listing because it's completely free. And uh, you know your listing is going to be indexed for all of those keywords. The problem is when you take all of those and throw them into PPC, those aren't free anymore. You have to pay to collect that data. And guys, this is how you're going to end up spending thousands and thousands of dollars of wasted ad spend. Uh, It's doing stuff like this. So, you know, take Mike's advice there. Uh, Be really careful with the actual keywords that you're throwing into your manual campaigns. Uh, And also be very careful about the match types that you're selecting inside of your uh, campaigns as well. Yeah, you know, the way that I like to view like campaign growth is almost like a like a tree that's branching out. So it's like you start with your auto and then something converts. Boom. Now you have an exact match winner. I'll often take that and I'll throw that into broad and phrase. Now I'm doing research around that term. So if don't worry, if you do the RPSB method, you'll get plenty of keyword ideas. Um, but doing it in sort of the more controlled way will Keep your, I mean, we're in it for the long haul, right? It will just save you cash over the long haul. Absolutely. And then our next topic here, should you bid on your own brand and should you bid on your competitor's brands? What are your thoughts on that, Mike? This is a hotly debated topic. Uh, I've heard lots of smart people have strong opinions on either side uh, of this issue. So should you bid on your own brand? Let's start there. Uh, I always like to bid on my own brand. If I'm working with a client, boom, you should be bidding on your own brand. Ad Badger bids on our own brand on Google. Um, now the question is why? And the biggest, the biggest, uh, argument against bidding on your own brand is, well, wouldn't people find me anyway? And here's what I say. Uh, if, if a customer is walking up to your physical storefront business and you're standing near the door, would you open the door for them? And it's like, well, they're going to come inside anyway. They're walking towards the door. Bidding on your own brand is the equivalent of opening the door for them. Sure, they would have come inside anyway. However, it's just making it that much easier. Give them all the opportunity to click. If someone's searching for Ad Badger on Google, I want to own every single square inch of that search result page. If someone's searching for jump rope and I sell a great jump rope uh, and someone types in Mike's jump rope, I want to make it so easy for them to find one of my jump ropes. The the keywords are going to be so cheap because I'm going to get such a high quality score. Uh, the, the conversion rate is going to be so high. It's just going to be a, a negligible amount of spend. And I just want to make it so much easier to, for ha- to have people convert. The other thing too if I'm not there, a competitor is going to be there. You know, competitors constantly want to uh, hop on the Badger's coattails and grab some of our branded traffic. So if we're not bidding on our own terms, probably a competitor is. Uh, and we want to make it 
difficult for anyone to try to steal some of our branded searches. We worked hard for those branded searches. Let's collect them. The last thing is, which people often don't think of, is just the way that search result pages work. Meaning, uh, a, just based off the way that search result pages work, the top result will get some clicks, the next result will get slightly fewer clicks, the third result gets slightly fewer clicks, so on and so forth. So if I could take in more spaces on that search result page, I'll have a net gain. Uh, it's almost like one plus one equals three, because not only am I uh, bidding on my own term, I have the organic, I have the paid ads, maybe I'll have the sponsored brand ads. I'll just take over the entire page. Uh, and what will happen is if, um, so Google releases this data on their ads platform, I'm waiting for Amazon to release the same kind of information, but basically show you the click-through rate when it was just organic, the click-through rate of when it was just paid, and then the pooled click-through rate when both appeared. And what generally happens is that the pooled click-through rate is greater than the sum of when it was just paid by itself and just organic. So I am so enthusiastic to bid on your own brand. Uh, I know I'm going off, I know I'm talking a lot, but the last reason to bid on your own brand is because it helps your overall account quality. So Amazon likes advertisers who are successful. They like advertisers that serve ads, that get loads of clicks, that have high click-through rates, that have high conversion rates. So if you can serve your own brand, I mean, these are gonna be some of the best clicks, highest converting, highest click-through rate, highest revenue per click. Why wouldn't you let Amazon know that you're a great advertiser? By, and this will boost the rest of your campaigns. Mm -hmm. You know, I have, a, I have a little personal story about this that uh, it's really gonna make your heart sink, Mike. <laughs> so, uh, for this Christmas break, uh, my parents actually drove all the way to Austin, Texas from Florida. And uh, we got here and we were interested in this restaurant called The Oasis in Austin. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we put it up to my mom to Google it because we'd never been here and we wanted to make sure that, uh, you know, it'd be a good place to go. So she clicked or she uh, opened up Google. She typed in The Oasis Austin. And she clicked the very first ad on the page that mm -hmm. had nothing to do with the Oasis. Whoa. Just, it really hurt. <laughs> yep. But that's just even more of an argument to, uh, to make sure that you're bidding on your own brand. So, you know, so that type of thing doesn't happen. You, there are a lot of people who uh, aren't professional Googlers and aren't around the internet very much. And they just go ahead and click on the very first result, which mm -hmm. happens to be an ad on Google all the time. Yeah. So. You know, more and more searches are happening on Amazon mobile, uh, and there's not a lot of screen real estate on there. So if you're not bidding on your own brand, it's very likely that maybe a competitor is, that something else is there. And people, you know, most people are not listening to this podcast. Uh, as much as I, I hate to say it, there are more people who will not listen to the Ad Badger podcast than who will. Uh, so like most people are not professional digital mar digital marketers. Uh, most people, when they make a search, it's like, yeah, they just click on whatever the first thing is. They assume that Amazon is serving them the most relevant thing for whatever they're searching for. Um, so if someone's searching Mike's jump rope, but they see uh, a rogue fitness jump rope pop up first, well, then they're probably just going to assume that Amazon thinks it's more important that they see a rogue fitness jump rope, even if I just typed in Mike's jump rope. Uh, this is just the way that it works, which segues perfectly to, should I be bidding on my competitors' brands? I say yes. Uh, absolutely. I, I tend to agree with you there. And the reasoning behind it is you can just you know, steal a little bit of market share from your competitors and you can bring a customer over to your brand. And, you know, guys, that may not just be for one little sale. You could acquire a customer for life by bidding on your competitors' brands. And that can equate to hundreds of dollars over a customer's lifetime. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, you have to ask yourself, uh, you know, we have like a cost per acquisition target or a target A cost target for people searching, you know, general campaigns. But how much would we pay to sort of, uh, I don't want to say steal because it's a, it's a loaded word, but how much would we pay to influence a competitor's customer to come over to us, right? So one of the hardest things to do uh, to get someone to, to leave, to, to stop what they're doing and consider and convert to you, you'd probably pay a little bit extra 
for that person because you know you're you're not only getting a sale but you are getting a sale from a competitor you know these things are pretty valuable so oftentimes i'll segment this out into its own ad group i'll call it competitor brands and i'll probably have an a cost target that's like two or sometimes three times greater than what the account sort of normal a cost is just because it's you know these these are potentially valuable you know if we can potentially intercept a sale we can, we have the opportunity to turn someone into a customer for life Mm -hmm. And, you know, one thing to watch out for this, guys, is if you do end up bidding on a competitor's brand, be aware that it can come right back around to you and they can bid on your brand as well and kind of drive that bid cost up. So, uh, you know, just be aware of that. Uh, There are some pros to bidding on your competitor's brands, but just be ready for them to uh, retaliate if they are that sort of competitor. (laughs) Jumping to the next topic, we've got two left. The first one, Bid Plus. Um, and you know what else, Brett? Uh, Amazon just rolled out some new bidding features, which we're probably going to dive into in a future episode uh, as we get to sort of learn more and test it more. But one of the ones that's been around for a long time is this concept of Bid Plus. And essentially, you know, long story short, is that Bid Plus increases your bids uh, in order. For, if it thinks that you can appear in a top spot. And right off the bat, I give Bid Plus a big thumbs down uh, in general because most people are not bidding for a position, meaning we don't care if we're in position one or position two. We care way more about target ACOS. Agree or disagree, Brett? Totally agree. Yep. Um, I'm personally not a huge, huge fan of Bid Plus either, but uh, I'll let you continue with that. Yeah, I, I mean, maybe sometimes you'll you'll turn on Bid Plus. You know, maybe if it's Black Friday or you expect some type of uh, surge in traffic, then you know you want to be sure you stay in a top spot. Sure, you can turn it on, but just know you're probably going to jack up your ACOS. Uh, you know, this is it could potentially be the difference between bidding a dollar and a dollar fifty. Uh, you know, a fifty percent increase in ad spend is pretty significant. Uh, so just be aware of why you're turning it on. Be intentional about it. Maybe you turn it on for uh, you know, some kind of event. Uh, maybe it's a hyper-competitive term where you don't care about ACOS that much. Maybe you would use it then. Um, what I would love instead is if we actually had bid by position, um, which says, you know, hey, if you want to appear in position two for a particular term or position one for a particular term, then you know, we'll set your bid and then we'll watch it and we'll try to get you there. Uh, this will be a feature probably in, in Ad Badger in the future. I think it would be really valuable. Uh, it'll probably involve us having to like, because uh, Amazon doesn't release position data. Uh, so we'd probably have to, uh, you know, scrape Amazon, throw it into our app and connect it with our bids by Badger. Mm-hmm. That's down the line. Um, the last, speaking of ranking, uh, everyone knows about Amazon organic ranking but people might not be thinking of Amazon ad ranking more than cost per click. What do we mean by that? So basically, uh, let's assume that your product is better than uh, competitors of yours, but you both are bidding a dollar on the exact same keyword. Uh, All that this means is Amazon will actually favor uh, the company and the ad which is going to be more profitable for Amazon, meaning a uh, higher click-through rate, higher conversion rate, basically the one that's going to generate a higher revenue for Amazon based on their 15% fee that they get for every sale, uh, plus the bid. So, you know, if you're, if you're Amazon, this makes sense. You want to maximize the amount of revenue that's coming into your platform. Uh, and this is a really good way of doing so. There's Uh, You know, there's the bid on one hand, and then there's the ad quality score on the other hand. And ad quality score is uh, not like fully disclosed. I mean, what do you know about it, Mike? Yeah. You know, I think the easiest way to understand ad quality score is just to, all of these platforms, Facebook, Google, Amazon, they all have ways to incentivize the right kind of advertiser. You know, they want people to be the right kind of advertisers. They want people to engage with ads because that's how they make some extra cash. Uh, In fact, with Amazon, it's one of their fastest growing uh, areas of their business. Uh, They're putting more and more ads. So they want to be sure that if someone clicks on an ad, that that they have had a positive experience. And how do we measure 
a positive experience. Well, it's sort of all the similar characteristics to the organic result. Uh, your revenue per click, your BSR, your click-through rate, your conversion rate, all of these things that people go to Amazon for. You know, that people, people don't want to go to Amazon and not find a product to purchase. You know, people are on Amazon to buy something, to solve some need, to do something. They want to buy a gift for someone. Uh, they want to buy a gift for their favorite podcasts. Uh, hosts. They want to, you know, buy a gift for themselves or whoever it might be. And if you go to Amazon and don't accomplish that, that's like a failed mission. So if you're clicking on an ad and don't end up buying something, Amazon doesn't want that to happen. Um, so if you have a higher conversion rate, revenue per click, all these different things, Amazon will favor your ads over your competitors. So basically the way that it works, it's like your cost per click multiplied by your ad quality equals your ad rank. So if Brett and I are both bidding a dollar, but my ad quality, which is the sort of the sum of all those variables that I just mentioned, is 10 out of 10. That means I'll have an ad rank score of 10. And Brett, if you have a if you're also bidding a dollar, but you have an ad quality of just seven, well then you'll only have an ad rank quality of seven. I'll appear above you even though we're both bidding the same. That's generally the way that it works. Now conversely there are some times where you could potentially bid lower than a competitor, but they but you appear above them. The way that you accomplish that is just by having really strong cost per click. I'm sorry, really strong click through rates, strong conversion rates, strong revenue per click, all those good things. And that is some talk on ad rank, and that's all our topics. Yeah, I think you know just between podcast episode six uh, last week and episode seven this week, we really dove into all things sponsored products. And, you know, hopefully by now our viewers have, or our listeners have a better understanding of, you know, uh, what's really behind sponsored products, how they work, the different metrics and things to look out for. And next week, I'm excited to say that we're actually going to be diving into structure and organization and naming, which is really the next big step in getting to that point of having really well optimized and really efficient campaigns. That's right. If you made it to the end of the episode, we just want to say thank you. Uh, you know, we are new at podcasting and believe it or not, this is actually the fourth time we've recorded this episode. Uh, you know, Brett and I are good at many things on the computer. Uh, however, we've had uh, audio skip on, skip on us. We've had audio get canceled. Uh, I'm still a little nervous that this might even not make it uh so if you've made it this far thank you so much uh we really appreciate it and we will see you next week on the ad badger podcast feel free to check us out at adbadger.com slash podcast or anywhere where you get your podcasts mm -hmm. see you next week guys take care